welcome to Lessons from the Long Trail. We're really delighted to have you all here. We see there's a lot of you that we haven't seen before, and we're really, that's, that's very nice. So, so um, welcome from the Dummerston Conservation Commission. Uh, and if you can, the, the, the money that you give uh, if you can put something in the jar, uh, helps us not only to bring in speakers like Deb, but also we're doing uh, <coughs> school programs now, school programs for the kids at the Dummerston School. Um, so <coughs> we, um, we appreciate your help mm -hmm. and support with that. So without further ado, Deb Luskin, I think I would need to introduce you. Well, there's a lot of friends here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks all for coming out. Uh, so. I'm going to tell you about my end-to-end -end through hike of the Long Trail that I did last summer. So, uh, they were 25 days. That changed my life. Uh, we walked, we, we left Massachusetts on the 15th of August and arrived in Canada on the 8th of September. Somewhere in the middle when we've lost track of days, I'm, we're going north, we're in the middle of the state, someone says, where are you going? We said to Canada. And the guy said, before the election? <laughs> and you know what? I'd forgotten. I had been so I mean I'd forgotten there was that, that nasty election going on, which was really not such a bad thing to forget. Um, I went with my friend Jan, and this is the genesis of the trip. She came to visit me in on May 3rd, 2015, uh, two years ago. Uh, she lives in Alaska. We went to college together. We've been friends for 40 years. We've rarely seen each other because we live on other sides. But she um, came, uh, she told me she had something to tell me. She wanted to tell me something in person. So I knew that meant that she was either gravely ill or getting divorced. And um, she came, she visited me for 24 hours. We talked for 18. <laughs> and she's about to leave. She's, she's getting, we're just like getting the last 3,000 words in. And I looked at her, we're completely unprepared for this. And I said, do you want to, do you want to hike the long trail? And she said, sure, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> I should tell you that because she lives in Alaska, she spent, she, she spent the last 40 years doing incredible exotic things, uh, helicoptering into remote cabins to ski for, a week to, she goes kayaking for 10 days into remote cabins. She also has gone bike riding in China. She's driven in, down to Guatemala from Alaska. Um, so she's kind of um, a rolling stone, and I am not. <laughs> but so she asked me what it was, and I said, oh, wow, well, the Long Trail is the oldest recreational uh, footpath in, the, the, in North America, actually. It, was envisioned by an assistant headmaster of Saxon's, uh, no, Vermont Academy in Saxon's River in 1910 on the summit of Stratton Mountain. <laughs> and uh, in 1930 it opened. It was actually, um, it inspired the Appalachian Trail, which was after that. So, um, and, and then, so, so Jan, we, we had this blitz of a, a visit. She said, sure, and then I forgot about it. And um, she called me up in December, and she said, well, when are we going? <laughs> because she had to buy her plane ticket. And I said, well, we need 30 days, you know, and we want to go, we don't want to leave before mid-August because there are too many AT hikers on the trail. And she says, well, I have to be back on September 8th. Uh, September 10th, and so we worked backwards from there, and um, we started. I started telling people, "I'm going to go hike the Wong Trail," which is the verbal corollary of, <laughs> "If you build it, they will come. If you tell people, you have to do it." <laughs> so we did. Uh, what we carried, I brought uh, a facsimile. Uh, this is the backpack I carried. This is, um, and I, I have a, actually a list of all the things that we carried. Um, there's a sleeping bag at the bottom and a sleeping pad. So I have my bedroom and my kitchen. There's um, a stove, fuel, and uh, a titanium pot. There's one bowl, one spoon, one knife, and one fork. There's water bottle. There are a lot of water bottles, including this one. I'm not advertising, I'm not endorsing this, but this happens to be 
um, a really, the, the thinnest commercial bottle I could find. <laughs> These water bottles, you can buy really nice water bottles, um, and I have a million of them. But I carry these because they're lighter and weight matters. Uh, so, um, and drinking water is um, one of the four most important rules of hiking and backcountry living. Mm. And the four, the four, and speaking, <laughs> the four rules are hydrate, hygiene, hydrate, and hygiene. <laughs> and if you can only remember two, that's okay. Uh, we'll come back to that too. Um, the clothes we were wearing, this is actually, these are the clothes I was wearing. I rarely wore the, the legs. Um, this is all, this is the only thing that, I, I didn't need this in the summer. Um, this t-shirt's all high-tech, high-fiber, you know, the quick-drying stuff, Wick, wicking, it's terrific. Um, oh, you know, I actually have, I have everything here, um, which I can show you, actually, what I carry. My whole house, um, that's all food. So, this is my clothing, my entire wardrobe. And when I came back from the long trail, I went through my closet and got rid of half of it, and I still have too much. It is so liberating to have only what you need. And one of the great things about only having, you never have, you wake up in the morning, you never have to think, what am I going to wear? Uh, so I did have a change of clothes for when we got into camp. I had camp socks, and these are my camp shoes. It was really nice to take uh, my, my feet, my shoes, these are the shoes I wore. Uh, this is my t-shirt that I slept in, and I have a pair of shorts I slept in. Shorts is my pajamas. This is uh, my, my hat that I wore some of the time. Very little, though. At the summit, I'd wear this, because it was cold. And um, so you'll notice everything's lightweight. I had uh, a spare pair of socks. And I wore liner socks after my feet nearly fell apart the first, the first week. Uh, just a minute. There's a pair of liner socks in here. You'll take my word for it. Um, there they are. Here, liner socks. So I wore these under this, and that really solved the blister problem. Um, clean pair of Thunder Bundies, as we call them. And I also had a clothesline. So I would wash it, everything. I'd wash the liner, sock liners, and my underwear every night, and then hang it on my clothesline as I um, hike the next day, unless it was raining. Uh, the most important piece of clothing is the um, my bandana, which is um, sometimes was a sweatband, sometimes was. Um, a washcloth, a pot holder, a napkin, a tablecloth, never all at the same time. <laughs> and then we'll get back to what this is in a bit. And I, I, today, putting these on, I, I just realized how much I miss not having pockets in my regular clothes. So that was my wardrobe. Uh, what else did we carry? I'll tell you. It's, you know, you forget. But because everything was crucial. But not everything was um, is, is stuff you think about. So in my Crocs, yeah, I told you about those. I had one long sleeve shirt, which was not this one. It was my really old Putney Ski Club shirt, which I really love. But I needed something warmer when I left today. But hiking, you warm up. And so do you. Well, also speaking. Um, I had a rain jacket, which was also a windbreaker. Uh, the two hats, first aid, personal items, which included uh, toothbrush, toothpaste, and floss. Uh, and I confess, I brought my Kindle. And I read two books. Uh, and hiking poles, which I left at home, which is too bad. Uh, they were essential. And um, the things we couldn't live without, fresh water, that was, that was key, uh, the bandana, Trail map and guide, which we actually, um, the trail map and guide, we took the trail map, uh, rather the guide, we broke into three parts, so we only had to carry 
the part where we were, which was really good. Uh, the other essentials were um, the Gatorade bottle, was had bourbon in it, and um, the other essential was chocolate. You can go anywhere with these things. So um, the other final thing that we had was companionship. And the only things I missed were my husband, fresh fruit, and my dog. And uh, my husband came every weekend to resupply us and take our dirty clothes and give us fresh ones. Yes. And um, so, and he brought the dog and fresh fruit. So it wasn't really that bad. <laughs> um, food, what, f fuel and flavor. When um, Jen and I started having regular Skypes to plan the trip, and I said, okay, we're gonna bring um, rice and beans and, she, and we'll be vegetarian. And she said, no. <laughs> She said, we need, and she's, of course, she's the one with all the uh, experience. She says, we need variety and texture. And uh, I said, okay, <laughs> what do I know? I, I have never been on such a long trip before. Um, so uh, I did say, you know, I said, acquiesced immediately on that, and I said, but we're going to make it all ourselves. And she said, absolutely. So uh, this is what happens when you put a quart jar of uh, Green Mountain salsa through the dehydrator. <laughs> it, it turns into uh, a sheet of paper, uh, the, you know, a sheet of salsa leather about this size, and it doesn't weigh very much. And um, I also dehydrated tomato, uh, homemade, homegrown homemade tomato sauce into tomato leather, and um, all sorts of stuff. We, had, we ate really well. I also went to the grocery store uh, this com regular commercial grocery store and troll the aisles for food that could be made with water in um, 10 minutes or less and it had to have a certain caloric value. Let me tell you, this is a whole new way of going shopping. <laughs> oh no, it doesn't have enough calories. <laughs> <laughs> or it weighs too much. Uh, and so we made all our, we, we put together all these uh, food. Um, Ms. Sorensen has said she's been reading my blog. So there's a whole section called Lessons from the Long Trail. And there are, there's uh, one on the food we carry and one on the lessons, rather the recipes for the food we carry. And so we made them and I have a vacuum sealer because I grow a lot of our own food and seal it. And we, for some reason, the night before we left, it's late at night, we're still packing, we decided to weigh each of our dinners. And it was such a good thing because that was the next thing we didn't have to decide. What's for dinner? What weighs the most? <laughs> that was it. Um, it was great. Uh, this is what we lived without. We didn't have electronics. We didn't have cosmetics. There are a whole lot of other things we didn't have. Uh, I didn't even think about them until today. I didn't carry keys. I, I didn't have any of this stuff. I had. Um, a health insurance card, a driver's license, and a credit card, and a little bit of cash. And I didn't carry any cosmetics, no lipstick, or a comb. And I haven't actually used a comb <laughs> since. <laughs> Very liberating. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to go on the trip was I, I just felt my, my uh, concentration was so fractured. Emails, texts, phone calls, hardly ever. <laughs> no, no one uses a phone to talk anymore. Um, I was writing a lot of short pieces. I was going on short walks. I wanted to think, with, like get my concentration back. And that, this was wonderful. I would turn my phone on. I did use it to text my husband where we were and what else we needed him to bring. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then I, had, um, I would see the, that little red number go up and up and up and up. And when I got home, there were 600 emails. It took four days for me to go through them. Most of them, I didn't have to do anything <coughs> about, but I couldn't stand looking at them that long. But that was a great thing to, to give up. So it takes three miles. If you go from, uh, it, well, either way, it takes, you can't just get on the long trail. You have to hike there. Um, and you start in Massachusetts, and you go for three and a half miles uh, to get to the Vermont border. And I think we'd been on the trail for about 10 minutes. First of all, we put on our backpacks. We'd, we'd weighed them that morning, 35 pounds. And that was with the water in them. And we, friends drop us off, we shoulder our packs and stagger. 
and take our poles right out. Okay, we need these. And they helped a lot. It gives you two more feet um, to distribute the weight. And we're walking, it's hot. We didn't get on the trail till after 10 in the morning. It's hot. It's a, I've been on this trail before. It's, there's something about it. It's just hot. <laughs> and I'm, I, we're, we're going for maybe 10 minutes, and I say to Jan, we're never going to make it. <laughs> 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 what do you mean? <laughs> and I said, we're just going too slowly. And, um, <laughs> and, she, and she said, we just started. <laughs> so we made it to the border, and I thought, okay, let's just set small achievable goals. And so our next goal was to make it to the Seth Warner shelter. We got there at three, and then we start, we go on to the next shelter after that. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but we get there, it's getting dark. We've been, uh, we've been walking our first day out. We're now going 13 miles. And I think, Jan, and I start getting anxious. I am not, I have not spent my life out in the outback doing all these adventures because she lives on the other side of the country. I've done some hiking, but I can feel myself, you know, it's getting dark. <laughs> and she goes, well, we've got to be getting closer. And sure enough, around the next berm, you know, the next bend, we are at the shelter. And we have a, a great thing. So um, I learned, one of the things I learned is how to <coughs> stay calm. And, and it's, I mean, it's what a gift. Uh, just breathe and stay calm and just take one step at a time. It's very zen. Um, we were, this is our third morning, and we learned about checklists and routines. So one of the, one of the routines we did was um, we told stories, which I'll tell you more about. But you only have this much stuff. You think, how hard could it be to pack it all up? <laughs> Let me tell you. Um, you see these? So in the morning, I put on my pants with the, with the bottoms on them. And then we get ready to go, and I put on my shoes, and then I'd remember I had to take the leg, unzip the legs to get my shorts on, and I had to take my shoes off. I mean, all these, these are little things, but every single one of them puts you back and gets you later, later start. So we're walking, I'm telling a story, and I tell Jan about the checklist. Um, it's an article I read in the New Yorker by Atelga one day about checklists used in medicine in operating rooms. Mm -hmm and we develop our own checklist. And let me tell you, I think this is an audience that would appreciate this. It has applications off the trail and outside of medicine as well. You could learn to put your keys in your pocketbook in the same place every day when you walk in, and then you wouldn't spend so much time looking for them. But these damn cell phones. I have spent more time in my life looking for my cell phone, calling it off and calling it, and I can't hear it because I keep it on mute. <laughs> problems we've created for ourselves. So, um, so we developed routines and checklists to get us out at the crack of nine. Uh, we told stories. Mm. We hadn't seen each other in a long time. And we'd seen each other half a dozen times in 40 years. We did not write or telephone call. We um, really, we hardly knew much of what was going on in between the times we saw each other until Facebook came on. And then we started, you know, so, uh, but we were also really busy. She has just retired from being a lawyer in Juneau, and I'm never going to retire. Um, but we, we both had really busy lives in our places, marriages, children. We all, we, between us, we have five daughters, um, friends, activities, family members, far and wide. So um, we had 40 years of autobiography to catch up with. Um, and we started with Jan telling the story, the blow by blow, of her divorce, uh, which had progressed since I had seen her the year before. Jan married Jeff, uh, she met him when she was 14, moved in with him when he was, she was 18, married him at 22, and um, he had the, just, he fell in love with a coworker. Um, and when, just when she turned 60, well, 59, we did this for our 60th birthday, our joint. We, we turned 60 within a few days of each other, and this is what we did a few months later. So um, I got a blow-by-blow blow 
of this. Yeah. I told her about my life, uh, which progressed from getting a PhD to running a medical practice to being a full-time writer, which is what I always wanted to be and what I am. Um, but I also, a lot of my work has involved learning about the history of Vermont and, um, and doing research about Vermont. So I could also tell her that. She was born in California and migrated up to, uh, to, to Alaska. And she said, we were Skyping the other day, and she said something about, oh, my East Coast friends. And I said, uh, excuse me? <laughs> I'm one of them. And then she said, oh, I really did just lump you all together, didn't I? <laughs> and I said, it's all right. That's what I do about you West Coast people. <laughs> um, so at the end of week one, we got our first resupply. Uh, we needed more toilet paper, nail clippers, a new headlamp. I needed a new headlamp every single week. And um, Tim brought us fresh coffee, sticky buns, and uh, cucumbers from the garden. I mean, it was just fantastic. And then he joined us. He and one of my daughters actually joined us, and, and we um, spent the weekend hiking together. They left us. We did our first 16-mile day. This is us at the top of Killington. I am wearing the hat you can see, um, and the windbreaker. It was cold up there. And we stayed that night at the Inn at Long Trail. And we had um, lousy beds, but really good showers and a great <laughs> meal. Um, now we get to the four, the four rules. Um, every shelter has a privy and a water source. These are really important. We drank at least four liters of water a day, plus all the water that we um, that we cooked with, and the, the and we didn't have to purify the water that we um, washed with, but purification, water purification, is important. And mm, we used a Steri pen, so we did carry one wide mouth bottle between us. And this is a Steri pen. It uses I don't know light magic. Uh, and batteries, which I tell you from a bad experience, uh, run out. They, when, when you buy this at Sam's, all the instructions say, oh, it works for a thousand times. It doesn't say that's 15 batteries um, <laughs> <laughs> or more. I don't know. I haven't done it a thousand times yet. But it's really cool. You fill this up with water. You stick this in. You turn it on. A light goes on for 90 seconds, and voila, you are um, so, so, but when not one, but both of these ran out of juice, we had a backup of some sort of tablets that made the water taste terrible, so we knew it was good for us. And, um, and there are times when some of the water sources are pipes into springs, and we did not uh, purify that water because there's no time between the time it comes out of the ground into our water bottles for a raccoon to poop in it. Uh, which is really what you want to avoid. Um, so, oh, and there. Now, Jan also taught me about the pee rag. For the women in the room, this may be of interest to you. I did not know about this. I always drip dry, which after a while is uncomfortable and smelly. But if you carry and use, and I, you notice that this is significantly different in color from my <laughs> all-purpose bandana, um, and rinse it out every night, and then hang it in the back of your pack, you really have a lot more comfortable time. Um, so I now carry it whenever <coughs> I go hiking. And um, I think that's, that's, oh, and every night, so, so um, Jan also taught me Every night we'd get into camp, we'd be hiking for about 11 hours a day, but we would get into camp and we would wash and change into our camp clothes. And, you know, we're so used to all this water coming out of our walls when we want to take a shower. <laughs> if you don't have that, and all you have is a bowl, I have it. Um, yeah. So, this is my multi-purpose bowl. It was, um, my bathtub, my laundry machine, and what I ate out of. Again, not all at the same time. Uh, but this, this, and that was my cup. Uh, so, um, 
you, we would go down to whatever the water source was. We would go downstream from the water source, fill up the bowl, go into the woods, rinse off, and put on our my pajamas. Yeah, I put my pajamas on. Jen would put hers on, not the other way. And uh, <laughs> it was remarkable. As we, we would feel like completely refreshed and renewed. It, it takes so little. Um, it's it's quite lovely. And whenever we had a chance to wash our clothes, every week Tim would bring us, we, we had, when we left, we left a, a laundry basket with the other set of clothes and he'd bring it to us each week and then he'd bring it back with clean, the other ones cleaned. Um, so that was really nice and um, we swam whenever we could. So here's some of the, this is uh, the moon setting at 6.20 in the morning over Griffith's Lake. And it, it was pretty beautiful. Uh, we ate outdoors every, we, we were just outdoors all the time for 25 <laughs> days. Um, so we ate outside, we uh, slept in tents. Um, we carried a tent, I don't have it anymore because I borrowed it. Uh, it was a two and a half pound tent. Um, and we use it about 25% of the time. The first 100 miles of the long trail are the same as the first, as um, 100 miles of the 140 miles of the Appalachian Trail in Vermont. And I thought by going at August 15th we would have missed the bump, and I think we did, but there were still the laggards, including a guy named Turtle. <laughs> and um, so the, the shelters, could be filled. There was one, there, our second night out, there were 21 people in a 12 person wow. shelter. So we were glad we had our tent um, to set up. And, um, and one night, so our, our, at our last resupply, we knew the forecast for the next eight days was just beautiful. We um, gave Tim the tent, said we're not carrying it any further. And that night, we slept out under the stars on top of a mountain. It was really beautiful. Uh, I, have picture, I think I have pictures of that. Uh, resting was really important. We didn't necessarily sleep really well. Those platforms in the shelters were pretty hard, but we took a nap whenever we could. This is Jan napping. Uh, put our feet up. And then um, once we got to, uh, this was our first five summit day. This is a day, we're on top of Mount Abe here. And um, see, these are, these are the shorts. Yeah, this, these are the shorts, different shirts. Um, but this one, I can see, it's that stain, I don't wear it in public so much anymore. Um, we climbed Mount Abe, Mount Ellen, no, uh, no, first Abe, Lincoln, Ellen, then we crossed the Appalachian Gap, and we crossed Molly Stark, General Stark, and Baby Stark, and let me tell you, I am not very fond of the Starks anymore. Uh, so this is our second resupply, after going over, Abe, Lincoln, and Ellen, Tim met us with fresh peaches. I can remember these things. Fresh peaches, iced coffee, and oatmeal raisin cookies. And then we went down into the gap, uh, which is maybe Route 17. It's an east-west road. And then, and th so we got there at 5 o'clock. We did our resupply here in the parking lot. There's the laundry basket, picking out our clean stuff. Uh, and all our next, our next section of food. So it's six o'clock, we get back on the trail with our, he our again heavy packs. So as the week goes on, your packs get lighter and lighter and lighter, you eat all your food, and then Tim comes and he fills them up again. <laughs> and it's six o'clock at night, we have already done three mountain summits, and we get back on the trail. Uh, we are still smiling, but we still have a long way to go till we get to Birch Glen Camp, where we arrive in the dark. <laughs> okay, this is already the end of, uh, it's getting towards the end of August, and we meet, um, this is our second university orientation group, and they have taken over, the, the, they weren't expecting us. The other thing is that we walk, we get there at 8.30 at night, and we actually didn't turn our headlamps on until the last 15 minutes. It is amazing how much you can see if you don't have light. It, it's just one of those remarkable things. So we, um, the Tufts kids, it was Tufts University, they cleared out an entire side of the, of the shelter for us 
And we had our dog with us then, because Tim was with us, Leo, and these kids. So these were kids, it was their first time away from home, you know, they were going to college, they had all signed up and they said whether they were, uh, the, the leaders told us this, they sign up whether they're novice, intermediate, or advanced backcountry <laughs> people, and then they all get assigned to whichever one is going. So some of these kids had never been, you know, outside the mall. And <laughs> they were in shell shock, and Leo was the ambassador of comfort for them. Uh, so that was really fun. And then we said goodbye to them. I had to give them a little, a little mom talk about you have to close the lid in the outhouse and lock the door. Um, but you know, I'm a mom, so I can do that, and I did. And the leaders were very grateful. Um, so the next day, we, we hike up to Montclair Glen Lodge, which is the staging ground for going up Camel's Hump. And we get there in good time, with, we have a five o'clock dinner. This is fa fabulous. And it's dinner Tim brought, so there's like fresh fruit in it, fresh food. And uh, we, eight o'clock, we're in bed. Nine o'clock, a quarter of nine, Leo starts barking. And there's a lot of bear signs, and there's actually a bear box at this place. And we think, oh no. There's a bear. And then we hear this voice going, we, a lot of voices saying, Leo! <laughs> <laughs> and it was the, uni the Tufts University kids <laughs> arriving in the dark and so comforted that Leo had shown up. It was great. Um, and this is the next day we climbed Camel's Hump. And because Tim and Leo were with us, Tim, uh, we asked Tim to tell us a story. And Jan asked for the story of organic chemistry, and that's what he told us. <laughs> it was very entertaining. Um, at the end of that, uh, we parted. We parted uh, with Tim and Leo, and actually, um, Jan and I both had different friends at, uh, in mid-state. And originally, we were both, I wanted to meet her friend in Vermont, but I ended up seeing another very dear friend in Vermont, and she went to stay with this other friend of hers, who she, someone she'd met in Outback, Alaska. So um, we parted for the night. I went to my friend Fran's house, where she said, do you want to take a shower or a bath? And I said, shower before dinner, bath after dinner. <laughs> and then she and Mick fed me. And all right, first I had to shower. Then she and Mick fed me, and she says, you want your bath? She said, no, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> she said, and she washed all my clothes, which were already practically clean. Um, so that was really nice. And then we reconvened. Um, and the Duxbury Road is one of the longest stretches, of four-mile stretch of going through, like, on a road and then through cultivated fields. And Jan loved this, so I had to take a picture of it. This, I saw this from the interstate yesterday, uh, last week. It's a little library. Interstate 89 is here. The trail goes under the interstate. Um, and then we had to go over a stile. We went through cultivated fields along the river. And this is a footbridge on the, Win this is the Winooski River. So we were on paved road for a bit. And then we crossed the Winooski on a bridge that just opened up in 2015. Um, I don't really know how they got across before that. But it was a lovely bridge. Um, and then um, we had to overcome resistance. So this was Mount Mansfield. This was a big hike. Um, I climbed Mount Mansfield 30 years ago on my honeymoon. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I wasn't wearing a pack. This is the view Jan had of me most of the time. <laughs> From the back, there's the tent. Um, did I tell you I don't like heights? <laughs> I don't like heights. Um, we had no choice but to go up. And uh, we did. So we also had, a, we did have a choice. We could have taken the Wampahoofus Trail, which is recommended for people carrying backpacks, but we wanted to stay on the long trail. And we know why it's not recommended for backpacks <laughs> now. Uh, because we encountered uh, what they call a rock in a hard place. There was a place where there's a rock overhang, and we actually couldn't fit through with our backpack. Fortunately, we carried and used, where is it? Yeah, I carried this little bag filled with cord. And we used it to tie our bags up to when we camp, when we did wild camping to keep our food from the bears. Um, the mice still got them. And we actually got up uh, and I, 
I took my pack off, I climbed up, I threw rope down to Jan, she tied onto my pack, I hauled my pack up, then I hauled her pack up, and then she came up. So this was really important to have with us. Um, and we had to overcome fear. So this is a footpath over an abyss. This is where I was, um, I'm not wearing my pack here. This is what we had to, to haul things up. We could be clever. Uh, it was terrific. We got to the forehead. We were going from the forehead to the chin. This was our shortest day. It was an eight, eight mile day, eight maybe, yeah, I think it was about 6.8. It was a short day. It took forever, partly because people told us how hard it was. And they also told us, oh, when you go over the chin, you have to land on this little ridge. So I'm dragging my feet. I don't want to go to a little ledge. I just don't. Um, and, and I'm really anxious about it, which is kind of silly. This is me on the ledge. It's not so little. Um, and it is this very narrow, it's a narrow, slightly technical descent on the cleft of the chin. And there were people waiting to come up, and they sort of said, okay, a little further to the left, you'll get your foot on that toe hold. And it was really, you know, the people helping you, it was great. So um, we did it. And it was worth it. That's what it looks like on the top of the world. Uh, Mount Mansfield, you all know, is the tallest mountain in Vermont. And then we developed, uh, we depended on the kindness of strangers. So we get down off Mansfield at 4.30 in the afternoon. And we still have four more miles to the next shelter. And they are vertical miles up. And we're beat. And it's 4.30. It's a really prime time to make a bad decision. And we don't. It's just amazing to me. Because uh, Jan is game. She said, well, we have headlights. And I said, well, mine doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and, and I know Stowe. I'd spent a lot of time in Stowe. So I knew we could, we could hitch into town. But I had the end-to-end -end hiker's guide to the Long Trail. And it said there was a campground two miles, or it was a mile down the road. And at the campground, where one of the added benefits is we, had our, we still had our tent. We, we slept in the tent, but we changed dollars for quarters. And we took a hot shower, an unplanned hot shower. It was pretty nice. It was our third and last of the trip. Um, and we met Katie in the, in the uh, ladies' room, waiting for her shower. And we talked with her, and she was there with her dad. And so the next morning, I'm up real early. That's the other thing is, I'm the early person, and Jan's the late person. So I would make breakfast, and she would wash the after-dinner dishes. It was a good <laughs> arrangement. Um, and uh, Albert's coming down. He, he sees me, and he's walking, and, and he says, hi, hi. And it takes me a while. I, I'm very alert in the morning, but I'm slow to this sort of behavior. And I realize, oh yeah, here's a single dad. Yeah. <laughs> Duh. So I just smile and I say, hey, could you give us a lift to the trailhead? He goes, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't done that in a long time. So anyway, he and, Katie, he and Katie gave us a ride and said goodbye to us. It was really fun. Um, and then we have AIE and mud. And the, the peculiar thing is that this mud is that the, we're in the middle of a drought, first of all. We run out of, we run out of drinking water. I'll tell you about that. Um, and this is at the top of the, of the mountain. This is not where you expect to be confounded by mud. These are the shoes. And this is the one that got sucked off in the mud, right up to the rim. Jan's behind, well, I think this must be staged. But anyway, Jan plucked it out, and it was just dirty on the outside. But AIE stands for our motto, attitude is everything. <laughs> Mud! <laughs> um, it was really great. I, I had done 170 miles of the long trail prior to this trip, but over a lot of years in parts, including some famous ones that you may have heard stories of on the radio. Um, about marriage and um, and what color somebody's eyes are, <laughs> but anyway, and, and the time I got benighted and my husband called a search party out, and I was trying, I, I was wondering where he was and how I was going to tell my children I'd lost him in the woods, but that was and we stopped. We decided we'd rather be married than hike together. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I knew some of these hard parts, and 
and I just decided, okay, I can, I, you know, I'm not, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave that behind. I'm just gonna climb this hill. And um, attitude is everything, makes a big difference. And I've taken that home with me. This is uh, the night we stayed out on Larrabee Mountain. It was the Friday night of Labor Day weekend. We cooked dinner on this outcrop. We watched the sun go down. We watched the new moon go down. And then we watched this phenomenal fireworks display, about a half hour. It was just beautiful. Um, and there were also strangers involved in that, kindness of strangers. So we dumped the tent. We continued hiking. We knew where we, we thought we knew where we were going to look for a, a camping area. But we got there at 5 in the afternoon, and it was, it was a, sort of the edge of a grassy field that it, it was just kind of exposed. We decided we'd keep going. And at 6 o'clock, we stopped for snack and wondering. We're looking at this hillside and thinking, where are we going to put our sleeping bags? And we hear voices. And these two guys who are walking southbound stop and say hello. And we say, by any chance, you see any places to camp up there? And they said, oh, yeah, there's this perfect camping site. And they said, did you see any places to camp? And he said, well, yeah, the place we didn't stay, down by the water. And, and so it was, that, it was wonderful how people would exchange information. And that became critical as in the last week when water sources were drying up. Mm -hmm. This was sunrise from the same, the same view at sunrise. And that's um, looking down to Jeffersonville. So day 22, Devil's Gulch is beautiful. Uh, this big, giant blocks in the morning light. It was really pretty. And then we climb Mount Belvedere, and we're getting quiet. So we have been talking nonstop. <laughs> Tim would like, when he would join us, he would like hang back. He, he, he <laughs> the guys never shut up. We, we kept, we talked the whole time until about day 22, when all of a sudden we realized we're going to make it. It's going to be over. <laughs> and what are, you know, how are we going to apply all these lessons that we've learned? Because we were talking about the things that we we're learning the whole way. Um, and, and so our conversation changes to how are we going to live after this? Um, but we're still having fun. <laughs> uh, I can't see what Jan has in her hand, but oh, I think it's just her t-shirt. We have lunch. 17.2 um, miles from Canada. We actually leave the trail to go to a shelter that's a half mile off the trail because we know there's a spring there. This spring is a puddle about this size. It is so small that we need to use a cup to fill our water bottles, but it's delicious water. We, we purify it, we have it, we get to the next, we get to our night's camp, which is J camp, um, and there's a spring there, there's this entire field of mud, and that's the water source. And we think, ay. And we actually, again, carefully take the water off. It was delicious water. It was delicious water. But any water would be good. It was very hot by then, too. Uh, JP, this is the only place we encountered bugs on the whole trip. So one of the things we'd done, we had sunscreen with us, and we had uh, bug dope with us for the first week and we jettisoned it with, with Tim because at the first resupply because we didn't need to carry it. Most of the time we were in the woods. I had a hat if we, the few times we were not. These, this is the one piece of equipment I bought to go on the trip. Bifocals. This is what happens when you're older and you hike. I could have had a separate backpack or a trailer as it were for contacts, reading glasses, distance glasses, sunglasses, prescription sunglasses, <laughs> but I got these and they have little magnetic sun visor things, you know, lenses that go on, and then um, I just lost them, which is really tragic. But I'm wearing them here, and there are bugs uh, biting us here. But uh, we can see Canada, and um, we know we are nearly there. We have, but we still have a little walking to do. Um, this is our last night, was at Shooting Star Shelter. We had it to ourselves. It was beautiful. It's a beautiful shelter. There's a well at the shelter. It was dry, <laughs> and there's uh, we could see the water, and even if any if the previous people had left the priming jug filled, which they didn't, it wouldn't have been enough water. 
So we carried the jug and we had a, a plastic bag, a two and a half liter plastic bag that we would fill up for our uh, cooking and cleaning. And I walked back to um, a mile. After putting in a nine mile day, I walked back a mile, filled them up, and walked another mile back. So it turned into an 11 mile day. Um, but we had, and this is Jan writing, um, she, and, and this was our, our, our morning of, of gratitude and saying goodbye, but just as we're about to leave, this young woman shows up. I'm young. She's under 40. And, uh, <laughs> and she's just starting, and she's wasted. She's been a social worker in Worcester, Massachusetts. She just quit, and she's walking to get her head straight. And it was just wonderful, because we could tell her about our journey. And, uh, and this is the end of the trail. There's another sign, the northern end, and then we got to the international border, which is right there. That's it. It's in the swath. I didn't bring that many pictures of it. Um, it's border marker 592, and um, it was pretty wonderful. There I am at it. Um, to tell you the changes, I mean, attitude is everything. I learned if you just smile, go ahead, try it. <laughs> the endorphins, it releases the endorphins. Before I left, I have to say, I will confess, I was peevish, little things would just irritate me. Um, my concentration was fractured. I didn't get outside enough. Uh, I w had lost a lot of joy. And uh, go for a 25 day walk, you can get it back. Uh, and I can always change my attitude. That, that was a big thing to learn. So I didn't do this by myself. I, I, and so I am someone, I, I do have a family, but I spend most of my day alone. I even, even though I wouldn't move in with him 35 years ago unless I had a room of my own, he now has built me a room of my home, own that is separate from the house. And I made it too small for anyone to sleep in because I didn't want my kids to appropriate it as a love shack. And that's where I spend my days. I don't have a picture of it, but I have a little um, chapel of the imagination where I spend my days writing. And I think, you know, and I, I consider almost any human contact during that time as an imposition. <laughs> and um, it was really quite a revelation for me to realize that there's no way I would have gotten even past the Seth border. I would have turned around. Um, and having that kind of companionship with Jan, and Tim and I hike. I mean, I don't want to diss him at all, but he is like a mountain goat. He's tall, he grew up in the White Mountains. He hikes, he waits for me, he pulls out his poetry. I come chuffing up and he says, oh, you're here, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> don't I get to rest? So it was really, it was very different. Um, I haven't spent that much time with a girlfriend um, since I lived with Jan and five other people in college. Um, so it was really special. Uh, and Tim, here's a picture of him. His, so we all had trail names, and we gave him the one, the mule, uh, because he brought us all this stuff. He took our dirty stuff home. He, so he did some other things, too. I mean, he, he did our laundry. He brought us our food. He always brought us treats. He took care of the garden. He took care of the dog. He cleaned his own, you know, he cooked his own food at home. He did his own laundry. I'm assuming he got clean clothes to get to work. I wasn't there. I don't know. Um, and he holds down a really big job. So he was the hero of this. He made it happen. And I think it, um, he deserves a little credit. So I took him back. I've been back to the trail. I really missed the trail. I have to say, I missed it. We went back to Griffiths Lake with Leo in mid-October. Same hat, same backpack. There's the shirt I didn't wear tonight, but it's my favorite. Um, it was cold. It was, and there was, the full moon was there, and Jan and I had been there the night of the full moon, so it was exactly two, two months later. And the moon was so bright, it was like a searchlight. It never got dark that night. It was amazing. Uh, Christmas dinner on Stratton. It, this is, 
I, you know, all these years, I have been doing a big fuss over Christmas dinner. <laughs> what a mistake. <laughs> you have a <laughs> jelly, and you spend the day outside. And then, New Year's Eve, we, we hike back to um, Spruce Peak Shelter, which is just south of 3011. Uh, evidently, uh, Joe Cook isn't here. It's a place at Green Mountain Club. It's the, it's the Brattleboro section of the Green Mountain Club. Built this shelter and put a wood stove in it. Wood stove's no good, but <laughs> it was cold. Um, but the next day, Tim and I left our packs at the shelter and walked back to Prospect Rock, which overlooks Manchester. This is looking up the Meadowee Valley. And if you ever need an attitude adjustment or you want to get a better perspective on your life and the world at large, a good view um, of the world that's bigger than you is, uh, I highly recommend. So, I've been blogging about lessons for the long tail. You can, oh, this, is, this has been changed since then. Um, you can get this, this is on the internet. <laughs> and you can sign up and even have it sent to your mailbox every Wednesday. I, I publish an essay every Wednesday. They're not all about the long trail. Some of them are about living in place because I am a deeply rooted person um, who doesn't like to live ho leave home. I think a good day is when I don't get in the car. Um, and uh, I also blog about the Middle Ages meaning people between 40 and 70. <laughs> and uh, that also appears in the Rutland Herald. Uh, I'm very interested. We live, Vermont is the second oldest state in the nation, and we still have a paper that runs four different parenting essays. <laughs> I only see maybe one person here <laughs> who could be a parent still of young children. I mean, we are, could be grandparents, but... Um, it's out of our control. I'm trying to let go of that. <laughs> so anyway, you can sign up for this if you like. Um, uh, you can also hear me on VPR. And I think that's it. That is it. So. I am glad to answer questions. Uh, or at least take them, feel them, yeah. So with bears, in the Adirondacks, you have to have a bear canister, and mm -hmm. you don't have to have one, and that you didn't, bears didn't come. <laughs> Get your uh, I, the, I saw evidence of charismatic megafauna <laughs> in the form of their scat. Mm -hmm. The uh, biggest animal I saw was a rabbit. <laughs> Remember, Jen and I are talking the whole time. <laughs> we could have talked for another, we could have talked to the North Pole, but we couldn't walk any further. We were done. Um, we both lost, we, we didn't have enough, it's not that we didn't have enough food. I don't know how to do this. I should turn the lamp off. I should learn how to do this. Maybe I can do that. Okay. Um, what was I telling you? Just a minute. I, the, there's the bears. There were three bear boxes at three different shelters. One was the Seth Warner, uh, the first shelter in Vermont. That Western Mass to Stratton is a bear corridor. And so there are bear boxes at places where there are known bears. There was one at Montclair Glen Lodge uh, where there was a lot, a lot of signs. They had a lot of trouble. They had had a problem bear the year before. And then um, Tillotson Lodge, our second to last night, there was a bear box because there was a Green Mountain Patrol camp there for a week of uh, trail work. And so they had a lot of provisions and they had a bear box. Um, otherwise, their bears are very shy, and uh, people, I get, I, I should change my attitude, people have been pretty good about not, you know, hang, we hang food, um, but inside the shelters, every shelter has a, a broom. I don't think they get used very often, and the mice population in the southern, in the, the part of the Long Trail that's the AT is pretty severe. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, I'm not oh, worried about right. bears, but the uh, the ticks. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, I, I didn't worry about it. 
Um, <laughs> and I also didn't find any on me. Any yeah. yeah. Um, now, that said, different people have different experiences with ticks. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I don't know. My children, as evil remember, had head lice. I never had head lice as a kid. I had a lot of DDT in my diet. Um, and I, ticks, I've had a tick on me. Um, I've taken a course of antibiotics once. And I'm outside all the time. I think so some people like ticks like the way some people, mosquitoes get, yeah. like some people. You know, it, there's, there's a good, there's a, it's one of the benefits of being a cervic. <laughs> uh, but there are things you can do. People wear gaiters. People wear light colors, for sure. Um, hygiene. We didn't talk that much about hygiene beyond peeing uh, and water. Uh, and washing, I guess we did talk about it. But foot care. I would, um, I had, my, my feet were, first week, my feet were beat up. I ended up buddy taping two of my toes. I lost a toenail. I had really sort of world-class blisters. I used a salve made in... Southern Vermont by the Good Company. So at the strolling of the heifers before I left, um, the, they had a, a display. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going the long trail. And he gave me the sample. He says, take this, put it on everything. And I have now become a devotee of that. And I just emailed some to my daughter, who is <laughs> just finished her first month on the Appalachian Trail and had monster blisters. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sent her some of that. It's the Good Company? It's good. I um, just look. Yeah. Google good. Uh, they're, they're local. It's a calendula olive oil beeswax salve. It's magical. Mm -hmm. And uh, that moleskin, mm -hmm. washing feet, changing socks, all those, you know, all those things. Foot care is really critical. And you know, the other day Jan said, oh, you know, it's just amazing. We didn't get hurt. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was like, well, Jan, <coughs> you know, it's the sort of thing I worry about all the time. Here, I get in the car and I think, okay, let me just get home safely. I mean, I'm neurotic. I, it's okay. But on the trail, all I had to do was, like, not fall. You know, and uh, someone asked me, uh, 10 days after I got off the trail, I hurt my foot. <laughs> really, yes. Yeah. yeah. Your foot gear. Can you comment? My foot gear? Um, I started off in my keen hiking boots and wool socks, which... Uh, it was really hot and humid, and my feet swelled, and I was in incredible pain. Mm -hmm. And I asked him to please bring me the gray sneakers with the pink insides that were in my closet, which I bought at Sam's, you know, for their discount, um, as just lightweight hiking sort of sneakers is what I would call them. These are them. And I changed my sock combination to a lightweight liner and a darn tough sock, which is a thinner sock than what I was wearing. That, that uh, slipperiness of the, of the um, liner sock and the, the thinner wool sock is terrific. So my feet stopped hurting and my knees ached. Yeah, Kathy. Well, I have a blank all of a sudden. Um, okay, we'll come back. This is again. happening more and more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> Had not, it, it was hot, I remember last summer, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was hot mm -hmm. during the day, but at night, especially when you got farther up north, mm -hmm. it, you just slept with that little t-shirt on? And In a shorts. sleeping bag. Pretty well, warm sleeping bag. Yeah, <laughs> but still, that was it. That was enough? We were, so we didn't have enough, we had enough calories with us. I mean, I think Jan thinks we didn't. I lost my appetite. I lost 12 pounds. I mean, it was really good. But, <laughs> but I was burning. I was like, you know, my metabolism had, like, notched up. I was hot all the time. So it, it's, it's really different if you live active all the time. I mean, yeah. you walk yeah. 11 hours a day. Uh, it's physiological, physiologically, it, it changes you. Your, your sleeping bag is not very big. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's filling up. It's actually, it's, it's up to here. It is oh, um, it's at the very bottom. Right. It is, um, it, it's at the very bottom and it's in a compression sack, which is one of these. It's a down bag. Oh, right. It's not a down bag. It's a synthetic bag. So if it gets wet, it's still warm. Um, these are really cool bags. They, you fill them up 
And then you compress them down so they everything shrinks. Did that come with the silver oh. band? No. No. <laughs> this, you buy this separately. So even though my glasses were the most expensive thing, I managed to spend a little more money on that. Um, so a little bit about the food. What do I have in here? Food. Um, I also, this is a plastic peanut butter jar. We did not carry peanut butter, but we carried this jar and used it. We would rehydrate lunch uh, in the morning. And then you'd add warm water to uh, black bean di dip. You can buy in bulk at the co-op. You put it in here and uh, mix it up, put it in your backpack on the top, and at lunchtime, you have lunch. Uh, we also made salads with freeze-dried corn and um, not black bean. I can't remember. There were some freeze-dried things. We bought some of that. We bought some dehydrated vegetables that I didn't make. We ate really well, but evidently not enough. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have another one too. The vertical part, like yeah. you, until I think it was Camel's Hump, there, yeah. there was no really going up that much. It was. There's going up and going up. But it's gradual. It's gradual. <laughs> no. Uh, Glastonbury is not gradual. Gra Glastonbury is in Woodford, just north of Route 9. Uh -huh. It's a slog. I've done it twice. I would like to do it one time in like not humid weather. Uh, <laughs> But it is very steep, and of course it was day three. So you can go s northbound, which is what we did, no bow. And then as we got, we thought we were going to leave everybody in the dust, but it was Labor Day weekend, we're heading to Canada, and we started seeing people in their very clean clothes and their very heavy packs starting out going Sobo, southbound. Um, so there are different ways to do it. If I were going to do it again, and I am thinking about it, um, I would go Sobo and I would start in September and just follow the color south. Um, no bugs, and, but you'd have to carry more warm clothes and more probably more calories. So we had, this is the other thing, this chocolate looks like a lot of chocolate. We had um, 12 squares each week. And so for every six day period, and we each had one square of chocolate. Melt. It was so hot. Did, didn't it melt, was and amazing. it was amazing. We knew we only had one square yeah. every night. And since I'm back, I have tried to have just one square. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not possible. <laughs> it's like, what? how is that possible that, you know, when you, when, when you don't, well, there, there's a real lesson there. When you only have so much, you're satisfied. When you have too much, you're never satisfied. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of, it, it's, there's a lot to be learned from doing this, or something like it, or just hearing about it. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah. You mentioned you had a fear of heights. Yeah. On some mm -hmm. of the places you had transverse or whatever. Mm -hmm. How, what did you do? Did you say <coughs> mindfulness or just? Yeah, just mind, <laughs> mindfulness and intense concentration. Mm -hmm. So I've always had this fear of heights. Mm -hmm. And when I, was in, mm -hmm. when I was 20, I spent a year rock climbing in England, <laughs> including doing an, un, um, an unattached seawall traverse, which I sort of like amazed now that I did that. But you know, you have to face what you're fearful right. of. Yeah. Um, and if we wanted to finish the long trail, we had to go up over Mansfield. And if we had to go up over Mansfield, I just, but, but that's one, I, I do wish I could still rock climb, but I don't. Um, it's one of those things where you just focus. You had, mm -hmm. You're entirely present. It's much easier to be mindful when your life is hanging on your fingernails. Yeah. But I am trying to do this now through yoga and meditation. Mm -hmm. As, you know, you get older, you can change. <laughs> yeah. What was your family? Uh, uh, Rose Fire. It's the name of my farm, so my email address. Uh, and, Ru and, and Jan was Ch Chichaco, which is, she says, Alaskan for newcomer, because she was a newcomer to the territory. So uh, we hardly ever use them. <laughs> no, Deb Jan, it's much easier. <laughs> Thank you.